Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Light. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Retro Radio Sunday on Weird Darkness. Each week I bring you a show from the golden age of radio, but still in the genre of Weird Darkness. I'll have stories of the macabre and horror, mysteries and crime, and even some dark science fiction. If you're new here, welcome to the show! And if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. And please leave a rating and review on the podcast app you're listening from. Doing those things helps the show to keep growing. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to connect with me on social media, and more. Coming up, it's an episode from the Mercury Summer Theater called The Hitchhiker. The Mercury Summer Theater is a CBS radio drama series produced, directed, and starring Orson Welles. It was a short-lived summer radio series sponsored by Pabst Blue Ribbon, airing on Friday evenings in the summer of 1946, and it only lasted a total of 15 episodes. The show tried to recreate the success of Orson Welles' earlier Mercury Theater on the Air, which famously brought us the radio drama The War of the Worlds, but sadly, the Mercury Summer Theater couldn't find the same success as its predecessor. Tonight we'll hear an episode from June 21, 1946, entitled The Hitchhiker. The Hitchhiker was written by Lucille Fletcher, and the story was first presented to radio audiences several years earlier on November 17, 1941, again by Orson Welles, on The Orson Welles Show on CBS Radio. In fact, Welles performed The Hitchhiker four times on radio, and many of you are going to recognize the story from television as well as the radio play was adapted for a very notable 1960 episode of the TV series The Twilight Zone. And now, the Mercury Summer Radio Theater brings you, from June 21, 1946, on the CBS Radio Network, The Hitchhiker, directed and starring Orson Welles. So bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon, the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Ladies and gentlemen, the element of suspense is so vital to our story tonight that our sponsors, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, are omitting their usual commercial message during the intermission between the acts so that our play will go uninterrupted from spooky start to spooky finish. Therefore, let's give Ken Roberts his 45-second opportunity right now to extol the merits of that blended, splendid... Uh, Ken? Of that blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. Those two words tell the whole flavor story. You see, every single drop of Pabst Blue Ribbon is the happy result of blending, the full flavor blending of never less than 33 fine brews. That's right. Never less than 33 fine brews blend their individual taste tones to give you that splendid flavor. Not too light, not too heavy, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with the real beer taste coming through just the way you like it. Friends... These days, when your dealer is occasionally unable to supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like, please keep on asking. For every single bottle you do get will live up to the same high standards of quality and taste. Yes, every bottle will be, as always, blended, splendid, Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now, Mr. Wells. 
We of the Mercury reckon that a story doesn't have to appeal to the heart, it can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warm, sometimes you want your spine to tingle. Well, the tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to a classic among radio thrillers. Its author is one of the most gifted of all the writers who've ever worked for this medium, Lucille Fletcher, who wrote the greatest single radio script ever written. Sorry, wrong number. The title of this, her terrifying little tale of Gru, for this evening, is another spine tingler by name, The Hitchhiker. <laughs> I'm in an auto camp on Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, maybe it'll help me. It'll keep me from going crazy. But I must tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well. Perfectly well. Except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Ford V8, license number 6B7989. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it is not me who's gone mad. But something else. Something utterly beyond my control. But I must speak quickly. At any moment, the link with life may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, Mother. Here, give me a kiss and then I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. <laughs> now, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Oh. Hey, what's this, tears? Oh, it's just the trip, Ronald. I wish you weren't driving. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers now, on the road. Strangers? Don't you worry. There isn't anything going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. I was in excellent spirits. Drive ahead. Even the loneliness seemed like a lark. But I reckoned without him. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. He stepped off the walk, and if I hadn't swerved... If I hadn't swerved, I'd have hit him. I almost did. Almost did hit him. Now, I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb, pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he'd got there, but I thought maybe one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the skyway, and let him off. I didn't stop for him. Then, late that night, I saw him again. It was on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I could see him quite distinctly. The bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over his shoulders. He hailed me this time. Hello! I stepped on the gas like a shot. That's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides, the coincidences, or whatever it was, gave me the willies. I stopped at the next gas station. Yes, sir. Fill her up, will you? Check your oil? No, thanks. Nice night, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it it uh, has been raining here 
Lately, has it? Not a drop of rain all week. I don't know. I, I suppose that hasn't done your business any harm. Well, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, though. Ain't many pleasure cars out in the turnpike this season of the year. I guess not. What about hitchhikers? <laughs> hitchhikers here? Why, what's the matter? Don't you ever see any? A guy'd be a fool to start out to hitchhike on this road. Look at it. Then you never see anybody? No. Nope. Maybe they get a lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it's a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't pick up a guy for that long a ride. This is pretty lonesome country here, mountains and woods. Yeah. You ain't seen nobody like that, have you? Oh, no, no, it's, it's just a <laughs> technical question. Oh, I see. Well, uh, that'll be $1.49 with the tax. <laughs> The thing gradually passed from my mind as coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all next day until just outside of Zanesville, Ohio, I saw him again. It was a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence, nor was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little the cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked... He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello! Hello! I'd stopped the car, of course, for the detour. For a few minutes, I couldn't seem to find the new road. I realized he must be thinking that I'd stop for him. Hello! No, no, I'm... Not just now, I, I'm sorry. Going to California? No, no, not today. The other way, I'm, I'm going to New York. Sorry. Sorry! After I got the car back onto the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of picking him up, of having him sit beside me was somehow unbearable. Yet at the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. The fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The lights changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I, I caught myself searching the side of the road waiting for him to appear. Yep. What is it? What you want? You sell sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yep, we do. In the daytime. But it close up for the night. I know, but I, I was wondering if, if you could possibly may have a cup of coffee. Black coffee. Not at this time of night, mister. My wife's a cook and she's in bed. Well, now, uh, l listen, ju just a minute ago, there was a man standing here, right, right beside here, and... He was a suspicious-looking man. Henry? Who is it, Henry? It's nobody, Mother. She's a fan of things. She wants a cup of coffee. Go back into bed. I, I don't mean to disturb you, but you see... <coughs> I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. What was he doing? Nothing. You've been hitting the bottle. That's, a, that's what's the matter with you. You got nothing better to do than wake decent folk out of their hard-earned sleep. Now, get going. Go on. But he, he, he looked as though he was going to rob you. I ain't got nothing in this stand to lose. Now, on your way before I call out chair folks. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop to rest a little, but... I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. Few resort places there were closed. I had seen him at that roadside stand. 
I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I'd run him down. But I didn't see him again until late the next afternoon. I'd stopped the car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma. Let a train pass by when he appeared across the tracks. He was leaning against a telephone pole. It was a perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't even look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, veering the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then, something went wrong with the car. It, it stalled right on the tracks. The train was coming closer. I could hear its bell. I heard its cry, its whistle crying. Still, he stood there. Now I knew that he was beckoning. Beckoning me to my death. Frustrated him that time. The starter had worked at last. I managed to back up, but after the train had passed, he was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself be alone on the road for one minute. Hello there. Hello. Like a ride? What do you think? How far are you going? Amar Amarillo. I'll, I'll, I'll take you to Amarillo. Amarillo, Texas? Yeah, I'll drive you there. Gee. Hop here. It's... Mind if I take off my shoes? My dog's a killer. No, go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break this is. Swell car and decent guy driving all the way to Amarillo. All I've been getting so far is trucks. You hitchhike much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the break. Yeah, I think it would be. But I'll bet, though, you could, if, if, you, if you got a good pickup in a fast car, you could... Get to places faster than, what well, we'll say, another person in another car. I don't get you. Well, well you, you take me, for instance. Suppose I'm driving across the country at a nice steady clip of about 45 miles an hour. Couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road, waiting for lifts, beat me to town after town, provided she got picked up every time in a car that was doing 65 or, or 70 miles an hour? I don't know. Maybe she could, maybe she couldn't. What difference does it make? Oh, no, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. Oh, imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do if I was a good-looking fellow like yourself? Well, I'd just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and relax. If I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road... Hey! Did you see him, too? See who? That man, standing beside the barbed wire fence. I didn't see anybody. Right there. It was nothing, just a barbed wire fence. What did you think he was doing, trying to run into that barbed there wire fence? There was a man fence? there, I tell you. A, a thin, gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. I was trying to run him down. Run him down? You mean kill him? I'm, I'm trying to get rid of him. Or at least prove that he's real. But you, you say you didn't see him back there. You sure? I didn't see a soul. As far as that's concerned... Well, watch for him. Watch for him the next time. And keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute now. There! Look there! Hey, 
does this door work? I, I'm getting out of here. Did you see him that time? Did you no. see him? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. And I don't see how I will very long driving no, with look, you. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what came over me. Please, don't go. So if you'll excuse Please, me, Please, you mister. can't go. Listen, how'd you like to go to California? I'll drive you all the way to California. You think elephants all the way? No, thanks. Listen, please, just one minute. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend, just a good dose of sleep. There, I cut it now. No. No, you can't go. Leave your hands off of me, do you hear? Leave your hands off Come back here, please. Come back. She ran from me as if I was some kind of monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. I was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get a hold of myself. I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car, just a few hours, and sleep just along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket, just as a blanket, when I saw him coming toward me. Coming toward me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. I didn't wait for him to come any closer. Maybe, maybe I should have spoken to him then. Fought it out then and there for... Now he began to be everywhere. Whenever I stopped even for a minute for gas, for oil, for a drink, a pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich. He was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was standing near the drinking fountain, a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque where I bought ten gallons of gas. I was afraid now, afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in, in lunar landscape now, the great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. And now he didn't even wait for me to stop unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads. He waited for me at every other mile. I'd see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in its same attitude over the cold and lifeless ground, flitting over dried up rivers, over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in the pure and cloudless air. myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There's an auto camp here. It's cold. Almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I, I had the feeling that if I could speak to somebody familiar, somebody that I loved, I could pull myself together. Number, please. Long distance. Thank you. This is long distance. I'd like to put in a call to my home to Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> I'm Ronald Adams. The number is Beechwood 99970. Thank you. Thank you. What is your number? My number? It's, it's, it's 312. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. 
New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling a Beechwood 9970. I'd read somewhere that love could banish demons. It was in the middle of the morning. I knew Mother'd be home. I pictured her tall, white head in her crisp house dress going about her tasks. It would be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit $3.85 for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right. Deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello? Mrs. Adams' residence. Hello. Hello, Mother? This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, what? please? Who is this? This is Mrs. Whitney. Mrs. Whitney? I, I don't know any Mrs. Whitney. Is this Beechwood 9970? Yes. Where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The, the hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? What's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. A nervous breakdown. Nervous. Who is this calling? Nervous breakdown. My mother was never... Nervous. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Since the death of her... Oldest son, Ronald. Hey, what is this? What number is this? This is Beechwood 9970. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Sir, your three minutes are up. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so, I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. And so, I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm trying to get a hold of myself. Otherwise... Otherwise, I'll go crazy. Outside, it is night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me, stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa and mountains, prairies, and desert. Somewhere among them, he is waiting for me. Somewhere. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. Wells will be back in just a few seconds to tell you about next week's production of the Mercury Summer Theater. But first, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon wish to remind you that though you may not be able to get Pabst Blue Ribbon every time you want it in these days of grain restrictions, it is well worth your while to keep asking, for every bottle you do get will continue to live up to its name. 
And speaking of grain restrictions, not a single grain of wheat is being used in the brewing of beer and ale. And the grains that are being used by breweries are not the grains wanted for famine relief. Now, let me repeat. When you do get Pabst Blue Ribbon, you can be sure this truly great beer will be, as always, the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. As always, blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. Now, here is Orson Welles. Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we bring to your radio another Mercury favorite. We hope a favorite of yours. You've asked for it many times. We've performed it many times. Jane Eyre. And Jane will be played by a Mercury actress who was heard tonight and has been heard so often on our shows. One of the most gifted people we know in our business, Miss Alice Frost. Jane Eyre then, with Alice Frost and your obedient servant, that's the same time next week, same station. Please join us. Until then, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Paps Blue Ribbon Beer... For all of us on the Mercury Theater, including Bernard Herman, who wrote and conducted the music on this program, I remain, as always, obediently yours. More than one half of all our nation's workers make their living in the food industry or a related field. One of the largest groups in the food industry are the grocers. Next week in Chicago, the National Association of Retail Grocers, which represents more than 500,000 retailers, is holding its first post-war convention, at which problems of food distribution will be discussed and new ideas and methods will be worked out to better serve its customers. The makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer salute the grocer, who is doing his very best under trying conditions to keep America well-fed. This program came to you through the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, makers of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening to this week's retro radio episode of Weird Darkness. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio and leave a rating and review in the podcast app you listen from to help spread the word about Weird Darkness and Retro Radio Sunday. And a huge thanks to our friends at ClassicRadioStore.com for generously providing the old-time radio shows you hear on Weird Darkness Retro Radio Sunday. Remember, you can save 20% on all of the ClassicRadioStore.com shows by using the promo code WEIRD at checkout. The rest of the week, I narrate new stories of the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, and mysteries, so be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already done so. I upload episodes seven days a week. You can email me anytime and find all of my social media links on the contact page at WeirdDarkness.com. Also on the website, you can listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the newsletter to win monthly prizes, and more. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. If you love old-time radio, you'll want to visit our friends at ClassicRadioStore.com who provide all the shows for me to wear. At ClassicRadioStore.com, you'll find thousands of episodes available in pristine, digitally remastered sound. Every episode they offer at ClassicRadioStore.com has been transferred from the master recordings and digitally remastered for superior sound quality. That's why the episodes that you hear on Weird Darkness sound so clean. And the shows at ClassicRadioStore.com are all uncut, unedited, and are delivered to you as they were originally broadcast, including the classic commercials. You can download great shows that'll chill you and thrill you, such as Suspense, the Whistler, Inner Sanctum, Lights Out, and more. There are mystery and crime shows like Sherlock Holmes, Philip Marlowe, Dragnet, and Sam Spade. they got a great collection of old-time science fiction radio shows like X-1 or Dimension X. Plus, there is a ton of comedy and westerns there, too, if you want to relive the shows of yesteryear. All the shows are available to instantly digitally download, 
and the links never expire, so you can order them now and listen to them anytime you'd like. And because you're a listener of Weird Darkness, you can save 20% on any and all radio shows on the website by using the promo code WEIRD at checkout. Just visit ClassicRadioStore.com, select all the radio show packages you want, then at checkout use the promo code WEIRD and save 20% on your whole purchase. That's ClassicRadioStore.com, promo code WEIRD at checkout. <laughs> 